so thanks for, for coming. So uh, I always enjoy uh, coming here, so I am on the faculty here, but spend pretty much all my time in Singapore. Um, but it's always nice to come back, especially during tournament time. I get to watch a bunch of games like that. Uh, and not having to get up in the middle of the night. So, I'm really doing things like so yeah, so what I want to do is really just talk uh, uh, quite a bit about uh, some work that, that I've done with colleagues and, and others really around this topic of improving diet quality, which is a big deal uh, and something that we really need to be thinking about and really about uh, methods for, for doing that. And so what I really want to do is try to stress the, the value of using different approaches uh, and what we've done and, and really at the end talk about what we could do or should do uh, to improve diet quality. And, you know, obviously there's a big obesity problem uh, worldwide. You may not know, Singapore, uh, although has a much lower prevalence of obesity, uh, has a, a larger rate of increase than we see in the U.S. and has declared war on diabetes and recognizes that there's going to be a huge obesity problem even in Singapore. And in fact, it's not unique to Singapore. All of Asia is seeing very rapidly rising rates of, of obesity and chronic disease. So it's a big deal. And I, I'll talk a little bit about what Singapore is doing. and, and just to give you an example, Malaysia, for example, has just changed and has mandatory uh, labeling on, on foods now from a package label. So lots of action going on in this particular arena in, in Asia. So, so uh, I'll talk about that, but the, the backdrop is, you know, this is the problem. Uh, really, there's not a, a lot of ways to tackle this issue. There's pricing and labeling strategies, which is really what I'll talk about. Education, uh, which may or may not work, the evidence is particularly compelling uh, on education for food policy. I guess there's legislation, which I won't talk about, but there are some things going on in that area too. But what I'll talk about is really empirical, uh, different strategies of research aimed at, at addressing these two issues. Now, the, the reality is a lot of the work that we tend to do is RCTs randomized trials in lots of different areas. And I think <laughs> NIH loves RCTs. And if you try to propose anything that's not an RCT, somebody on the review panel will give you a review of my time uh, and tell you your results are going to be biased, blah, blah, blah. But I, I want to, for those of you who teach or who are relevant, I, I want to point to an article. I'll read this. It's long, but it, this just came out. And Angus Deaton, have you guys heard of Angus Deaton? Anybody? Has a Nobel Prize in economics. So the, the economists certainly are familiar with him. But he actually um, uh, writes in a lot of different areas. But he, he and Nancy Curry just came out with this paper really about RCTs. And the gist of his claim is essentially randomization does not equalize uh, everything other than the treatment in the treatment and control groups it does not automatically deliver a precise estimate of the average treatment effect, and it does not relieve us of the need to think about observed or unobserved covariance. And basically, he goes on to say that RCTs can play a role in building scientific knowledge and useful predictions, uh, but essentially they're not the be all and end all, and we need to combine them with other strategies. And I think. This is a paper that everybody should take a look at. I mean, he really does this, they go through the math and they explain these things, but I think this idea that everybody is going to get the average treatment effect that we see from an RCT is kind of a silly idea, and we should know that, but we tend to forget that over and over. In fact, just to, to give you a, an example of this issue, I sit on the advisory board for Weight Watchers, and Weight Watchers is I, I, a, a, a science first company and they run lots of RCTs comparing their Weight Watchers programs to other programs. And generally speaking, in the RCTs they find about 5% of weight loss at six months and people tend to gain the weight back eventually. Uh, and they use those to do messaging so they don't get sued by, by the uh, FTC. But there's a, a question that says, or at least one should ask, is are these RCT, well done RCT results at all predictive of what people who join Weight Watchers actually lose or get? And what do you think the answer is? No, they're not. They're not predictive at all. 
And so then that begs the question, well, why are we doing all of these RCTs around weight loss when most of us know, and I'm sure great, none of them are predictive of what real people get when they join these programs. And if you're the FTC and you say, well, what should we be requiring people to put in their, you know, their promotion? Should it be the results from well-conducted trials that nobody seems to, to get? Or should it be what people get in the real world? And if it should be the latter, then why are we doing all of these trials? Right? And why do we always use this control group that gets no weight loss, which we can know, and compare them to this random line of weight? So it seems silly, but we do it, and we have to do it, because unfortunately we don't do it, and IH won't fund us. But I think it, it begs the question of, of what, are, what questions are we trying to answer, and should we be doing it a different way? And I do lots of RCT, so I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing these things, but I also do lots of other things, and I think the reality is this is the end that, you know, sort of the piece is that we need to be doing these RCTs, but also integrating that work within the real world and seeing whether or not what we get out of these trials generalizes. And the weight loss, you know, I think that's a pretty good example, but the reality is for behavioral interventions where people tend to self-select into things that they like, RCTs tend to perform very badly at prediction. Right? And so I think we need to recognize that selection, and in fact, the outcomes that we get are partly selection and partly intervention effects. But if you take away the selection, you know, it becomes less and less pretty. And in diet quality, it's the same issue. So just keep that in mind. And I'll talk a little bit as we go through about some of the things that I think uh, RCTs do well at and some of the things they do less well at. But I think this is an important thing to be thinking about. Now, early in my career, I did lots of observational studies. And that was when I was working down the street at, at RTI. And the reason we did lots of observational studies is because there's lots of great data in the U.S. to do these types of studies. Uh, when I got to Singapore as an econometrician, I realized very quickly I was actually quite bored because there was no data to do anything. And I tried to get data for about a year, and then I just said, forget it, started collecting my own data and started doing lots of studies and cohort studies and trials and stuff. So I sort of, you'll see as you, I progressed through, I switched. Uh, from doing lots of, of, you know, econometric analyses on existing data to running lots of trials. But now I'm actually trying to move back to doing empirical studies that are less trial-based because I think we need to be doing those types of things. But let me just give you some examples. So, so these are studies that I did with uh, colleagues from, from RTI and USDA uh, years ago. So this one was a 2010 study. And basically, there's a great data set that, that the Nielsen Company used to put out. It still exists, but it's by a different company now. But it's basically, they recruit a bunch of, uh, of households who scan in all of their food, uh, and you get their prices. And then you can use the variation in prices uh, that different households face to try to understand what is the role of prices in influencing demand for certain foods, and what we were interested in was trying to understand what might happen if you tax beverages. So in this first paper, we did an econometric analysis, you know, <coughs> secondary data analysis, using this data to try to understand the, the impact of price increases on changes, and we would assume reductions in, in purchases of sugar sweetened beverages. And what we found was that, you know, for households that face higher prices, and I'm very careful with my language here on purpose, but for households that face higher prices, they purchase less SSPs, and then they lost like the teeniest of, of weight on average. Uh, so we said, well, there's some hope here. Now, I use language that I was careful not to, to make causal statements. So why did I not make a causal statement here? So I didn't say price increases result in less consumption or purchases of SSPs. Why not? Could be other things that are leading to the reduction in purchasing. Other could than price. be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it could be, right? And in certain households, I mean, if they have a, a bigger income coming in, then you know it doesn't really mm. make a difference whether the price is high or low. Mm. Maybe. 
It could be. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but we can look at that. Yeah. So what would your hypothesis be? That basically lower income households would be more responsive to price increases? Yeah, so we've looked at that. I can show you some data on that. Yeah. Could be. So the, the point here, when you're doing these cross-sectional studies, like if I drew a supply and demand, well, uh, I can draw one. But basically, if we're trying to estimate price increases, this is just sort of basic <coughs> economics. If we want to see how quantity demanded changes due to a price increase or a tax, what we would like to see is some exogenous shock, like a, a tax that reduces supply and that would change equilibrium from here to here. And we could just look at the reduction in quantity. And we would say, oh, that's a perfect test. That's an unbiased estimate. But what we might be seeing in my data here are any different movement of supply. Like, I can't guarantee it was just a shift of the supply curve. It could be movements of supply and demand. It could be just changes in demand. In which case, I might actually get weird effects that I, it looks like higher prices actually induce less consumption. Or more consumption. So, so wacky things can happen. So that's just one of the challenges, which we sort of ignore in this particular case. But there's actually a worse issue, which I'll get back to in a little while. Uh, but basically, this is cross-sectional. So we can't, like in a trial, we can't sort of change the prices and then watch what people do, which is what you would like to do in a trial. But trials, as we just showed, have their own challenges. But what, what we can do, there is a strategy called instrumental variables, which is something economists use quite a bit. That's an econometric way of getting at, at this issue that prices are, are endogenous or essentially could be influenced by both changes in supply and changes in demand. And I won't get into the details of it, but only to say that the idea behind it is you need something that's correlated with the prices that households face, but only impacts how much they purchase through that prices. And so we end up using prices in surrounding stores that would be influenced, that would influence the prices in the stores that they shop at, but then only influence their <coughs> consumption by changing those prices. That's just a simple way. But basically, when we do that, then we move closer <coughs> to what you would get from the randomized controlled trial. Now, in this study, it's kind of lame in that we only looked at the SSB prices. But the reality is you might assume, or you would expect, that if you raise prices of SSBs high enough, people will just buy some other thing. And maybe their calories could go even higher. Maybe they buy chocolate, or maybe it's not calories that, that go up, but they buy something with more sodium or more fat. Right? So if you want to think about this holistically, uh, you really need to be thinking about what happens when they purchase other things that they're likely to purchase. So in this case, we use instrumental variables, which solves the endogeneity issue if you believe that our instruments were good. And we, uh, we let substitution occur to 12 categories that we think people would likely substitute to. So we did pretty well. Uh, and again, we found you, know, you could maybe get up to three pounds of weight loss, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it depends on how it's distributed. Right? So if you get, on average, three pounds, but there's a subset of people that get a lot, maybe that could make a difference. Right? So this was, was better, but still uh, lots of challenges in the econometrics. Now, I won't go into the details, but in a follow-on study, we used a really sophisticated uh, econometric technique where we modeled everything as a system. So instead of just modeling beverage consumption, and allowing substitutions, we model purchases, not consumption, but purchases of 23 types of goods simultaneously, recognizing that people are substituting back and forth as prices are, are higher or lower in different markets. And using this approach, we do a better job of getting at the cross price effects. And in fact, what we found was that uh, if you don't do this, you're gonna overestimate the effects. But even here, what we found was that you do get a bit of a reduction in calories, but an increase in sodium and fat, and so you could actually tax SSBs and make people worse off. 
And this is an issue which I'll, I'll keep referring back to. Uh, when you're looking at food quality, you have to think about what problem you're actually trying to solve, right? And that sounds silly, but it turns out that, that people miss this. Governments miss this all the time when they think about, like, like in Singapore, and I'll get back to this in a little while, they've declared a war on diabetes and they're very worried about obesity, but when you look at their policy, their food policy, it's not based on trying to get people to consume fewer calories. So it's not going to have the effect that they think it will have, and I'll show that in a minute. It's, it seems silly, but this happens over and over. Now the problem with this paper, which by the way we published it at the best Ag Econ Journal, is it's largely not understandable, even by me, but my colleagues, <laughs> to, to get it. So I think it will have a minimal impact on policy. And I think that's one of the challenges with doing these types of studies, is that if you really do them so well, it becomes very complicated, and then people just, their eyes gloss over and they don't pay attention. So that's one of the, the challenges that you have with the econometric studies. Now let me, let me switch gears and talk about some of my, my labeling stuff when we were using secondary data. Now, I've done several of these more recently as I'll talk about, but the first one we did, King County in uh, Washington State was one of the first places to mandate uh, calorie labeling in fast food restaurants and full service restaurants. Uh, and so we, we were fortunate to get some data, and I'll talk about it in a second, to see what happens when you put these labels in place. But, but before I do that, I want to ask the question, and this is the, the type of question that, that uh, Deaton was telling us we should be thinking about. What, what would your hypothesis be on what happens when you put these labels on foods, whether it be store-bought foods or restaurants, in terms of calories? What would we expect to happen and why? We might expect that awareness of calorie content increases and therefore consumption of calories decreases when one would hope. So I agree with you on the first one, but, but say your second one again, because your second one is assuming something, something that may or may not be true. Well, we would hope that awareness would translate to knowledge, which would translate to behavior change, that they would decrease their calories. So it's the last one that I'm not, so why are you saying decrease? Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're assuming something that may not be true, right? I'm so assuming that people underestimate how much they consume. And so once they realize how much they consume, they Right, eat. so this is an assumption. So you're assuming, so I, I'm with you when you say that people have no idea uh, on the calorie content of the foods they eat. And I, I do this with my students all the time, and I throw up a bunch of foods, and it's largely silly how off they are. <coughs> but your second assumption is that they tend to overestimate how many calories are in things. And that assumption is generally wrong. They're just wrong. But they're not systematically wrong in the way that, you, that you're thinking. And so once you understand that, what it suggests is that we can show people this calorie information and it's possible that net calories go up. Because people are like, oh, I didn't realize that Coke only has 300 calories. I thought it had 500. I'm going to drink more Coke, right? So theory tells us or can help us understand why some of the results we get might look a little bit wacky. And in fact, so just talking about the first one I did, we used a, a strategy called difference in differences which basically says we took the stores in King County before and after the labeling of these, uh, these restaurants, uh, and we compared the change to restaurants outside King County that didn't see the thing, and the, the difference of the difference we assumed was due to the, uh, the labeling. And that's essentially sort of mirroring what you would do in a trial, but using real data. Now, we did it at taco time, which, by the way, is quite good if you've ever been there. Uh, and um, it turns out we, didn't, we saw nothing. Now, 
seeing nothing to me doesn't necessarily say the labels don't work because you know if people thought the food some people thought you know the food was worse than it was others thought it was better and on average maybe these things so now they're eating tacos with better information but on average these things net out right doesn't mean labels don't work this actually might be what we would have predicted or should have predicted right now but there are some other issues right so if you saw this result and you were you know some policy maker what might you conclude if any like is this you know go ahead we don't have to do this we don't need to label it if it's not going to be effective on what we're what it's supposed to achieve which is to Could. make people choose healthier options yeah i think that's one conclusion but i suppose you didn't want to make that conclusion so you're a pro labor, <laughs> which a lot of public health people are, right? What might you argue? That the restaurant should change their recipes to be conducive with calories. Mm. Well, okay, so I'm glad you brought that up. You could you could make that case. I mean, so. Here's, okay, so one of the downsides of RCTs, and I'll get back to this point later, is it's it's certainly possible. So from this, when rest, they say, well, it doesn't seem to matter on the label, it doesn't change purchases, so who cares? I don't need to worry about this. So I can, because of course, restaurants were very resistant to labeling because they thought it hurt would hurt sales. It doesn't seem to hurt sales, so they're not so worried about it, but suppose it really did hurt sales. What do we think restaurants might do? Change their portion sizes. They, they might. Yeah. They might change their portion sizes. Uh, or offer more healthy foods. You know? They yeah. might, I will argue later, they might offer less healthy foods. And I'll tell you mm -hmm. why in a little while. But they might respond. And I only want to bring this up because RCTs wouldn't allow us to test these things. Right. right? So that's, again, one of the drawbacks of RCTs is it's so stylish. But in the real world, if we have data, we can see, say, what retailers would actually do. Now, to spoil the story here is what I would say is, well, when people go to taco time, they're not exactly looking to cut calories, <coughs> right? Let's be honest about that. And so just because it didn't work in taco time doesn't mean that it wouldn't work in other places. So I don't know how generalizable my taco time study is. Maybe it's generalizable to Taco Bell, or you know, who knows? Maybe even other fast food places. But certainly, the types of people who go to Taco Time uh, are not so generalizable. Just like those wacky people who participate in randomized controlled trials, who are a special breed, we suspect. So I think we have to be careful how we interpret or overinterpret these types of results. Uh, that being said, there's lots of, of studies uh, looking at the effects of labeling, and the general consensus is either null effects or small effects of labeling. Just a question related to that. So do we know, and I don't, I don't know this literature that well, who it does work for? Because like you said, there's a, probably a small subset it does work for. Yeah, hold that question and I'll, okay. I'll uh, tell you about that in a second. Go ahead. Well, also, I don't really know this literature, but what if it impacts overall calorie content? Maybe it doesn't affect your purchasing, but what you learned at the taco place may change how you eat at home or eat later, or you know, impact I mean, it, a different it's outcome. possible, but I, it, to me, if it doesn't change your eating where it's most salient, I find it hard to believe. But it's a fair question, it's testable, but I'm skeptical. But let's, let me get back to your question in a second. So, uh, Nuval, have any of you guys seen or heard of Nuval? These were in lots of stores for a while. So David Katz at Yale created this company, uh, proprietary, to try to make money off of his Nuval score. And it took every food and it got a score from one to 100. And of course, shoppers have no idea what this means other than to say, 100 is better than 99, which is better than 98. And that may be all you need to make 
changes in your purchase. So we've actually done quite a few analyses of NewVal. Now, this one, I actually, we published this last year. Uh, I, I, I love this study because I found it to be clever. Sorry to be a little arrogant for a second, but just to tell you what we did. So what lots of people would do is they would compare <coughs> NewVal stores to non-NewVal stores and maybe even use that difference in difference approach. Uh, we talked about, but there's selection effect of some stores, maybe only Whole Foods picks up new val, you know, some, so it's hard to use that, there's potential biases. But what we did was it turned out in 2014, they changed their algorithm. And so certain foods basically had their score go up or go down, so the same product suddenly looked healthier or looked less healthy. And we looked at what was the, the consequence of a, a food changing you know, within the relative to other foods. And we actually looked at yogurts. Now it turns out yogurts are a great product to study for Nubal because there are some yogurts that score like in the 80s and some yogurts that score in the teens. There are yogurts that are basically like eating sugar, right? And they have like twigs on all these candies. And then there are some that are pretty healthy. But it turned out when, when uh, NuVal changed their algorithm, some NuVal scores changed quite a bit. On average, the scores tended to get better, but some got far better than others. So it was a really neat sort of natural experiment to see what happened among shoppers in these NuVal stores when the score changed. Uh, and it actually, we found that it, it worked. So scores, yogurts whose scores went up, uh, tended to do better in terms of sales, uh, but yogurts who went down tended to do worse. Now, in answer to your question, the average was not huge, but we did a survey and we looked at what percentage of people even knew about the logo and knew that hire was bad. And so we asked a bunch of questions and it turned out there was about 10% of shoppers who said, yeah, we really use these things to make choices, and about 90% who didn't even recognize they were in the store. So these average effects are pretty small, but if the effect is based on that 10%, you get a subset of people who respond quite a bit. And I think that's another thing you have to keep in mind is that this average treatment effect is very misleading because the reality is most people are very different from the average. And I would say when it comes to these types of things, Probably 90% of people tend to get no effect, but there is this small group who's really influenced. And we see that even in my incentive studies. Like most people don't respond, respond to incentives, <coughs> except in Singapore where everybody seems to, but there's a small subset who will pretty much do anything for money. Uh, like the, I don't know, the, there's all sorts of lucky draw. They, they love that stuff. And so in Singapore and some people, they really, really respond, but most people never would. It's like Fitbits and these types of things. Like we published on Fitbit and most people, by three months, that thing is in a tour somewhere. But there are these wacky people who you know, are obsessed with their Fitbit and after a year or two years, they're still doing it. But the average treatment effect is always misleading and small. But in any case, so uh, this was a neat study. Now, I wanna get uh, back to this point about the shortcomings of RCTs and why some of these real world studies are so impactful. So let's assume, which I believe to be true, NuVal works, and our data supports that. So what would you expect to happen in the real world? So I gave you, you know, our outcome was that people change purchases based on the scores. So, so okay, keep going. What else? So the stores are gonna be stocking. Potentially raising prices. Okay, so what do we know about profit margins for foods? Pretty low. Low, but where are they worst? Or let me say, where is the best profit margin on foods? Definitely the process prepackaged. And what do we know about the process prepackaged and their new valve score? Lower. Lower. So who's unhappy about NuVal? The stores. Not the stores. The manufacturers. The manufacturers. 
So what do the manufacturers do? Manipulate their store. What was that? Figure out how to manipulate their store. Yeah. Or the food uh, products. Manipulate the food, food products on the higher, right? Well, they can do a couple of things. So they could reformulate, right? And try to get better. That would be the hope. Make their packages smaller, I guess, right there. Uh, they, they could, but the score is not based on package size. It's based on uh, per serve, right? But what else could they do? If I'm, a, if I'm a manufacturer and I see all of a sudden people are buying more of some of my products and less of others, and I'm a profit maximizer, what am I going to do? Stop making them. Well, not necessarily. People are still buying them. I don't have to stop making them. Make more if they hire a score one. I could make more, but what else could I do? Not economists. The economists would know this right away. Yeah. Yeah. Change the price? Yeah, raise my price, right? So I got a product that suddenly, yeah, it's always a good answer. Yeah. I've got a product that suddenly people are more interested in. I want to take advantage of that and raise my prices. And because those less healthy ones, people are less interested in, but those are my big profit margin foods. I don't want to stop stocking them because I make a lot of money off them, so I want to get people to purchase them. So what do I do? I lower the price on those, right? So I change my prices. Now in an RCT, you would never see that. But in the real world, and we have a paper we're working on now, we see, and I strongly uh, reject the hypothesis that they don't respond with price change. We very clearly see they change their prices. Now, because they change their prices, the real effect of Nubal is much smaller than what you would see in an RCT or what we published in that paper because once they change their prices, people tend to go back the other direction. Now, uh, the other thing is manufacturers, so generally speaking, uh, food stores are sort of like well, I don't know what's a good example. Basically, they just make a cut off of what's sold. So they basically have shelves, and they essentially rent shelf space uh, at, you know, they're like a mall. They just rent shop space. And they can rent more when those who are, you know, using that stuff makes more money. So when the manufacturers start complaining that I can't make as much money, in order for me to stay, you gotta lower your, you know, your rent. Then they say, well, how about we just get rid of Nuval? And so eventually, Nuval went out of business. So the last Nuval stores left last year, and our argument is Nuval died. <coughs> right? Now, so that suggests, if you believe that to be true, it suggests that the private sector is very unlikely to get a Nuval on its own. If you think that we want to have this, we need government to force these things in stores because the private sector doesn't have a profit motive to do these things. So that's what we argue in the store. Go ahead. So have you compared this to other labels that are, you know, government labels? Like, I can't think of uh, but There are some. They don't give a score, but... So there are lots of labels. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some labeling stuff in a second, but uh, I've done several different label comparisons, and I'll show you some of those results in a little bit. But basically, it's very hard to power studies in a trial to compare labels because the effects are still pretty small. But I'll get back to that point. Now, I just want to say other thing. Well, one other thing. If you think about what goes on when you shop, when you look at yogurts, let's suppose you really want to shop healthy and you see these scores. What do you do? Like, what do you think goes through your mind if you're standing in front of the yogurts and you're trying to pick one? The higher score. Yeah, you just, you say, all right, here's like, you, you think in your mind, like there's a bunch of numbers. I, I don't want to get like the best one, probably pretty taste bad. You know, you just say, all right, this one looks like it's in the right size. <coughs> and so people are shopping, and this is what we do with prices too. We just want to get one, it's relative. We look at all of the yogurts, and we're not going to look at like, you know, the chips or whatever, because they're in a totally different part of the store. So we just look at the yogurts. We know we want a yogurt. We look at all these numbers and we pick one that seems right. Now, what a savvy retailer could do, so he could introduce better products, which we already talked about, but he could also introduce worse products. 
if you throw a bunch of fives and tens, even if nobody ever buys them, it can reorient the way you're looking at all these products, and people could actually move back down to what they were buying before labeling, because the presence of these crappy products makes you feel not so bad about buying a 50 when, when otherwise you might have bought a 60. And in fact, this might sound crazy, but if you talk to people in the restaurant industry, they will tell you that they always put a super high-priced entree on menus, uh, not because they expect people to buy it, but because people buy the second highest and the third highest. So this sort of relative price or, or framing or anchoring effect actually is very common. Right? And we show in our paper that you can undo the effects of new valve solely by putting in these low score products. So it's pretty interesting. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about experimental studies. I know we're going to run short on time, but so we, we've done uh, studies on taxes and subjects using the experiment, but let me just get back to hypothesis. <coughs> so I think it's pretty clear that if you tax food, you should expect to see people buy less food. So if you tax SSBs, they'll buy less SSBs, and the hope is that calories will go down. What's our hypothesis for a subsidy? So if you subsidize that's fruit and vegetables, vegetables I'll buy more of them. Yeah. you'll buy more of them, and what about calories? If you subsidize the lower calorie foods, then they would go down. If you subsidize things, well, I, you're, to your point, you could then replace it with something else, you know, that's equal. So, so I think with taxes, it's very clear that if you tax foods or calories, people will consume fewer calories. But for a subsidy, it's not obvious. They can eat more of the food that's subsidized? Or I mean, suppose you made food free. You subsidized yeah, yeah. food entirely. So, People so, might use that income for other unhealthy. Yeah, for exactly. Yeah. yeah. Not only might they, they do. They do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I can say that because we showed it. So basically, this is a study that Len Epstein and I published years ago. And what we found was that taxes work. People consume less calories, but subsidies, basically they buy more fruit and vegetables, they take the savings and they buy more junk food, right? right? Mm -hmm. But theory helps us here because we should have thought ahead and the, the trial sort of reinforces what we should have done. But it's, it reinforces the point, like if you care about obesity and diabetes, don't subsidize fruits and vegetables, tax the things that you're unhappy about. Right? Now, okay, so, I won't go into details on these, but we did look at the effect of prices and Nouvelle uh, in combination. So the idea is, do you get a double whammy out of taxes and labels, or do you just have to do one? And what we found in this one was that there was no sort of additive effect. Right? And, and RCTs are good for this kind of thing, because in the real world, you just don't have these things occurring. So that's useful, but if you, for those of you who do trials, these factorial designs are appealing but they require huge sample sizes. And so they're incredibly burdensome to do. Uh, now, we did another study uh, where we were looking again at tax and subsidies in a, uh, uh, this time in, in an experimental grocery store, and we used a within-trial design. Within-trial designs are nice in that you, you take the same person and you expose them to different things, to taxes, to subsidies, to your control shop. And you're, you're able to get away with much fewer shoppers. The, the thing that you worry about in these is ordering effects. Like once I see a label, maybe I remember that some product. So, you, so even if you decide you're going to do a trial, you still have these questions of what's the right strategy. Now, I love being able to get you know, only 200 instead of 800 shoppers. But if the ordering effects matter, then you're in trouble. Right? So I think design considerations whether it's observation or experimental, uh, matter quite a bit. Now, <clears throat> let me switch gears a little bit. So when I, you know, a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to try to build a web-based grocery store in Singapore that would allow us to test things very quickly, right, for what works. Now, it turned out it took us several years to do what I had hoped to do very quickly, but we're finally at a point where we can do things fast. Uh, and the store that we built is really awesome in that it allows us to change lots of things very quickly and to run multiple things at once. 
and it sort of looks like this. In fact, I'm online, I think. So I can just show you the store. Uh, let's see if I can. So like this is our store, just by way of example. Oh, uh, this thing, hold on. <laughs> well, never mind, I don't know why I can't figure it out. But I can show you this video. called Redmark that is an online grocery store and we partner with them and so they shop on our store which as I mentioned is actually cool and then Redmark delivers the food but because it's a hassle to, to do all that when they finish shopping we spin a wheel and if it comes up red then they have to put their credit card in and buy all the food and it gets delivered if it comes up green then they don't so they don't shop every single time but they think they might and that thinking they might is enough to keep it legitimate. So the first study we did was looking at two different warning labels. So Singapore has come out and said they are definitely going to do some type of mandatory front of package label. But they don't know what. And the first one they tested, well, they asked us to test these two. And they said, we want it done very fast. So we did a really fast test for them. As a, uh, uh, really just as a pilot, but we didn't actually deliver the food, although we told people that it might happen. And what we found, by the way, which one do you think would work better? The simple one. Yeah. Yeah. This one? Yeah. So this is Chili's, by the way. They have one, although it's in Spanish. But otherwise, <coughs> it's the same. Uh, this one looks like cigarettes. Now, it turns out that this one was had to be bigger, just because to get the words to be visible. <laughs> But it turns out that it was the, the warning label one had a four percentage point reduction and the stop sign one was only two percentage points. But I don't know if it's because it was bigger or not. Uh, but it turns out that although it got people to consume less or purchase less of the targeted products, uh, we didn't actually see any differences in diet quality. So this is again getting back to the point about works. So a label can work if it gets people to consume less of the targeted product, but it doesn't really work if it doesn't improve diet quality. And I suspect most labels that we see don't do the latter, but they do the former. And I say that based on a lot of our studies. Now, Eric, can I ask, how did you, yeah. what is, how'd you operationalize diet quality? Is it just sugar? Uh, good question. So, no, we have a couple of different strategies. We use the AHEI. Mm -hmm. So we look at each NFP thing separately. Uh, and then we look at AHEI, and we look at average uh, score from the, uh, not MTF, what at NutriScore. So NutriScore is a summary. I'll show you NutriScore in a second, but we looked at the average NutriScore. So we looked at a bunch of different ones. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and this paper is published, so I can share it if anybody's interested. Now, this one here, this, by the way, my secretary built this logo. It's actually pretty good, but the reason we wanted to use our own logo was it turns out that there are two ways to implement front of package labels. One is to say, all right, I'm going to look at the yogurts, and among the yogurts that are better, I'm going to give them a, a lower calorie stamp. The other one is to say, I'm going to look at all the foods in my store, and the ones that are lower calorie, I'm going to give those so maybe no yogurts, maybe it's all the fruits and vegetables. So which do you think is a better strategy? And you, while you're thinking about that, Singapore uses something called a healthier choice symbol, which I'll show you. 
and they do it within category. Whereas in the UK, the traffic light system, you know, all of the worst products get red and all of the best products get green. So which do you think is better? Singapore is because they're comparing oranges to oranges and apples to apples, whereas the UK is just throwing everything together. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that I don't need to go down the, the carbonated beverage aisle and see everyone is red. I probably know that. And I don't shop by saying, oh, I'm not going to get these Doritos, I'm going to go get a vegetable. I probably will shop by looking at all of the chips and getting one that's healthier in the chip aisle. That said, my concern is that you can have a, a within category that's effective at getting people to buy healthier chips, but not actually being healthy. Right. And in fact, uh, so we, look, we looked at this, and I'll show you what we found. Uh, basically, the within category worked better for for full orders and just looking at beverages, the across didn't seem to do very much. But again, net calories didn't change. Now, one of the other issues, like the problem with this, and I, this is a real problem, and I'll show you the healthier choice symbol. If, if I see the, the uh, stop sign that says, this, don't eat this food, or I see that health warning message, and I care, I'll, I'll move away from that product. So I, my hypothesis is that you know, net calories should go down and people should consume less of those products. But what's the concern with this? Right, when you put something like this on the label, I might switch away from something without this, but what else might I do? Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I will say I do do that. I know I'm guilty of this. <laughs> so you run the real risk. So positive messages uh, are kind of like substance. It's saying, hey, this is a good product, over consuming. Mm -hmm. Whereas for negative messages, you tend not to have them. Now I will tell you, Singapore has already abandoned the ne negative messages because they got such pushback from industry. Right? So now they're thinking about other strategies. But the positive messages tend not to work very well because of that reason and you'll over-consume it so you don't see these effects. Now, so they asked us to look at two new ones, multiple traffic light and neutral score. Now, which of these two? So these are both real uh, ones that you could see. Uh, which of these two do you think would look, work better? Not the simple one, not the numbers. Yeah, I find this one just the It's old very old technical. Yeah. 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 Uh, so this one, to me, is sort of in the spirit of new value. Like, I don't really know what these things mean, but I, I know A is better than B, and so on. So this is one that we, we looked at, uh, and basically what we found was that the, the Nutri-Score one, you know, we looked at AGI, we looked at a bunch of other things, and Nutri-Score seemed to do better, right? There was enough of a difference in AGI. It did better on a couple of other things. Uh, but it wasn't like, it didn't rock it out in terms of improvements in diet quality. It seemed to have a, a bit. But my sense is, because HPV was, the Health Promotion Board in Singapore was so keen on having us test this so quickly, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to move it, announce a Nutri-Score mandatory FOP label pretty soon, mm -hmm. my sense. And by the way, one thing I love about Singapore is there's, there's because it's so small, like, I get a call from, like, you know, almost the equivalent of the head of CDC. There's just not a lot of layers. Whereas <coughs> when I was here, like, you know, I always talk to medium, below medium. Like, they really, it's so small that, like, the stuff we do really matters. And they call us and they tell us to do stuff and we do it. And so I, I love the fact that we really will make a difference. And there's lots of examples that the stuff we do influences policy. So they were quite happy to see this stuff. And even though it's, you know, it's not amazing, but I think these average treatment effects you know, probably for most people won't do much, but it, within that, that little bit of an average, there are some people who we suspect benefit quite a bit. Um, now, Eric, is that one the within or across category, the, 
the one that did well. So NutriScore, uh, it's an algorithm across, and it takes up. So okay. it's not a within. So like a C, like so all sodas could be a D. They all could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say I'm amazed that I find the score to be very strange. Some things that I wouldn't think would score well seem to. Yeah. So I think, you know, but that's partly the thing. Like we definitely can improve the average Nutri-score because people use it. But when you look at the calories and the, these other, it's pretty wacky. Yeah, and not what you would expect. Okay, so let me just talk to you about the healthier choice table. So this is what Singapore had uh, and has. And basically, they have these on a bunch of foods uh, and beverages that show things in incredibly small font, like low in sugar, low in sodium, low in fat, blah, blah, blah. And basically, people who care about these things, like me, do buy more of these things and probably overconsume as a result, or at least that's my sense. Singapore has never really evaluated these things. But just to give you an example, this is 200 ml of strawberry milk. It's more calorie dense than Coke, but it has the healthier choice because it's low in fat. High in sugar. Basically, if it's pink, it's not healthy, it's sort of the way I <laughs> so, but, but it's healthier than the full fat version, right? Now, you know, again, our predictions shouldn't be that you're, you know, like I said, Singapore, they care about, uh, you know, diabetes and we're on, you know, obesity, blah, blah, blah. This thing isn't going to get it done uh, because they don't even necessarily focus on calories. But they've been really pushing this HCS. Like they only revamped these things a couple of years ago. They've been pushing it, and I've been telling them for years that I guarantee you it doesn't improve diet quality, and they they don't like to evaluate their own stuff, so they were hesitant. But we finally did it. Uh, but I can tell you from a pilot study, we gave you know a bunch of people. By the way, this cake, angel food cake, gets the symbol because it's healthier than the other cakes. But we gave half the people a choice between, you know, a fruit plate or the cake with the logo and half without. And we said, if you were going to pick one, which would you choose? Uh, and in fact, when we didn't show it, you know, you saw this 30% chose the cake and 70% chose fruit. You slap the label on there, and suddenly this healthy cake goes like gangbusters. And in fact. If you look at dieters, basically dieters would never choose it without the symbol. You throw the symbol on there and a third of them like, oh, perfect. So my sense is, at best, this logo is not improving diet quality and quite likely maybe making it worse. So we finally tested it uh, and we, we looked at the logo a lot and we also added in this calorie equivalent because our thinking was because people might be buying based on sat, we would sort of remind them just of the calories. Now, the, the unfortunate thing is, although we finished the data, I don't have the results. Give me a week. But we'll see. My sense is it's not going to show what they hope. Now, I know I'm running out of time, but let me just show you one more uh, where we were looking at taxes. And one of the things that I want to point out about taxes, if you're going to implement a, a soda tax, you can do this, where basically you shop on our store or somebody's store, and you just see a price increase, and people buy or don't buy. Or you could actually do this, like they do in uh, Berkeley, where you say, hey, this product gets a 20% tax because it's high in calories, and then you label it very clear, right? Very salient message, along with a price increase. Or if you were really clever, you could not even raise the price, but just pretend that you did, right? And my hypothesis going in was that this might be all you need, right? Because it's saying to consumers, hey, we as government don't want you consuming this, so we're going to tell you very clearly, don't get it. We tell you there's a tax, even though there's not, and then we see what happens. So we did it, and basically what we found was that the tax price increase the the one that was very clearly dis displayed where it's best, but the fake tax uh, was only marginally worse, but again, no improvements in calories or other measures of diet quality. So this is sort of one of my big take home messages is that we can sort of have things that work, but don't work, right? They don't work because of the fact that, you know, they, they don't influence diet quality, so in the end, they're failures. So we have to be really careful about measuring the right thing. Now, uh, 
I'm running out of town, but I, time, but I just wanted to show you some stuff that we're working on now. So this one is, I'm, I'm excited to test this out, but basically we're going to use Nutri-Score, or as people shop, they can say, hey, I really care about calorie calories, I forget what this one is, or I care about sodium, or any of the things on the NF, oh, physical activity equivalents. And once they stick, they click one of these buttons, what they see changes. Because some people really care about, you know, um, bone and calcium, for example, or some people care about sodium or something. So we're gonna try to tailor the store for what people care most about. And then as they shop, this changes. And we tell them, <laughs> hey, get at least half your products in green, try to keep grains to 15%, and then as they shop, this changes. So basically, can we sort of give real-time feedback and nudges to, to improve diet quality? And what I really want to do with this is not so much do a trial, but just roll it out and see what happens, right? And what I'm most interested to see is, you know, we're gonna say something like, hey, after they shop on it, if we charge you $5 a year, would you pay $5 to be able to, to see this tour? You know, is there any value in the market for getting this type of thing, getting canned reports on your, so do people really care? Right, because otherwise you just run study after study after study and it never does any good. But can we actually do something that people would, would you know, see enough value in that they would use? And if the answer is no, then that's a pretty good message. So uh, another one we're looking at is cash back. Like, uh, you know, suppose we give small rewards for healthy shopping, like that actually influence people's purchases. Uh, we ha I just got funded with a grant to use actually this uh, multi-phase optimization like what we're doing to look at, you know, so this question came up earlier about, well, what works better? So we're gonna test different labels against each other. We're gonna pit different labels against each other. We're gonna pit positive labels, message labels, different types of labels. We're gonna look at ordering effects, we're gonna look at defaults, we're gonna look at messaging. So all of these things within our store, and this most design allows us to do these in a fairly elegant way, statistically elegant, and then ultimately put out what we think is an optimized store and then test that, I, I would say probably with an RCT, but also with a real world one as well, so that we can really see if this actually matters. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there, but basically, you know, the, the stuff that we're doing I think is interesting and, it, and it's fun, but at the end of the day, like, we really want to try to get people to be healthier. So we need to be doing studies that are, are useful and informative. And I think a lot of our studies are sort of partially informative, but if we're not really looking at measures of diet quality, if somebody, you know, consumes more products that have an HES symbol, that may or may not be interesting at all. So we have to be thinking about those things. Results from an RCT, average treatment effects, may or may not be interesting at all, right? What do we do with these results? How do we make them useful? And so I'm trying to think really hard about design considerations, real world impacts, uh, and, and trying to maximize the, the value of the types of studies that we're doing. And it's a process. I mean, I've been at this now 10 years, still barely making headway, but it's, it's worth doing. So uh, I think I'm out of time, but uh, if there are comments or questions, I would. Um, well, I kind of have two questions. Sure. The first is, where were most of the stores located? Like, were there <coughs> uh, neighborhoods that, or places that were? So my web store is online, so okay. people are shopping online. But like for Nuval, for example, <coughs> it was in hundreds of stores. Uh, like, a lot of stores in the South, for whatever reason. But uh, it's a fair question in that certain stores may be more or less likely to take up certain types of labor. I mean, ultimately, I think they're always trying to retain customers or but like these things don't drop out in the sky like they do in a trial. And the, and the reason why I asked that question is because I'm thinking of the dynamics of certain countries. Like, for instance, here in America, uh, people may have may not have necessarily have access to like may, our major grocery stores, but they have places like Family Dollar and Dollar General. Mm -hmm. Whereas other in other countries, they may not have something similar, but they may have like the what we call like our, our mom and pop stores of something similar. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And in fact, the, the problem with Singapore is 
very few calories. Like if you look at where people really get their calories, they they mostly are eating at these places called hawker centers, which sell pre like ready to eat. People just buy like rice and something, and so they're not buying a lot of prepared prepackaged foods, and very few people are cooking. So I would say even in Singapore, maybe it's 25% of calories come from the types of products on our web store. Now in places, in other places, like even in, in Indonesia or Malaysia, it's different. So they tend to buy more and cook more. So it does depend, yeah. But, you, but I mean, I think it's a fair point in that, like, you know, if you're only getting 25% of your calories from these types of foods, then your ability to show the effects is gonna be pretty small. And that's partly why I've argued SSBs are always the target, but the reality is even if people consume you know, let's say you cut out a third of SSB calories, what's it really going to do for obesity? Not that much. Other comments? Other comments? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I have a question. Go ahead, Melissa. I just put food in my mouth. So. Well, I just have a question because you're, you're, you know, you're the, particularly the ones with the, the fact that the labels on specific nutrients, like, I find that really interesting. Like, you could say, oh, this is healthy, low in fat, but not for sugar or calories, yeah, yeah. like the yogurt. But, you know, and then ultimately, and you're looking at diet quality. So why not label on diet quality? Like for, I'm, I'm doing a lot of DASH diet stuff lately, but even HEI to say like, this is an HEI approved, or well, like your so overall Nutri score is a, is a good, NutriScore and NuVal would be diet quality, right? Overall diet quality, overall. not Nutri okay, yeah. right. HEI is, is about, is, tr is not really useful for this kind of thing because HEI is about the health of your overall diet. Mm -hmm. So you could consume, there are certain products that sort of are low in calories, low, but they wouldn't score well on an HEI because they have zero protein. Right. So, so Nuval, Nutri, you know, NutriScore are good at the product level. The product level. So those, so we're moving toward that. And I think yeah. my sense is that uh, NutriScore is what Singapore is going to use because it doesn't. They they don't want to do this, you know stop sign or reporting <coughs> message because they don't want the Cokes and the big companies to be mad at that little Singapore for taking them big products. Okay. Whereas NutriScore is more holistic. I was just thinking of this from a health literacy standpoint. So it seems like you need pretty high literacy to interpret these scores and, and these labels. And so I wonder if the right people are being affected by these labelings. You know, the people most at risk? Uh, well, so I would say no, they're probably not affecting the right people, but I'm also not so convinced about the health literacy piece. I think the people, it's just, you know, if you're income constrained, you're gonna buy what's cheap, and what's cheap is less healthy. Like, no matter how literate you are, like, it's just, that's just the reality. And also, uh, like, if you don't care, you don't care. I mean, it's just not a priority to you for whatever reason. We show, by the way, in one of our studies that people who support taxes are more likely to change. Like in Berkeley, where everybody was pro SSP, you see bigger effects for people who are supporters. Right? But the literacy thing, I don't know. Like, to me, if you just tell me A is better than B and B is better than C in a neutral score, do I really need to have any understanding? Like, to me, that's all you need to know. Just buy good question, though. Maybe you could yeah. collect some health literacy scores and see do behaviors change based on health literacy score? It doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah, you right. So it's an empirical question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like NuVal, I don't get it at all, but I know that higher is better. Right. Mm -hmm. So we could. Right. And in fact, if you have a good health literacy, I'd be happy to include it. There's some, is there a scale or something? Well, there's, there's one that looks at the food label, and it's, a, it's uh, an assessment that uses the food label. Huh. Yeah, send me that. I mean, yeah, we can easily put that in our big slides. Well, let me stop because I know I'm out of time, but if people want to hang out. Thank you.